would like to call the May 20th regular board meeting for the Marshalltown School District Order. This is the time and the place for that meeting. Welcome to all of you who are with us. And welcome also to those of you who will be watching us on delayed broadcasts. Allow me to introduce the individuals at the table with me, starting on my right, Ross Harris, Janelle Carter, and Mike Miller. On my left, we have Karina Hernandez, Sean Heitman, and Ben Fletcher. At the center table with me to my right is Paulette Newbold, the secretary, board secretary. Darren Schuette is the superintendent, and he's seated on my left, and I am the media block. Our student representatives um, are joining us for the last meeting of their term, and we have Jane Raglan, America Dominguez, and Jocelyn Sharpnada. If you are here to address us during public comment, please make sure that you have signed up on the pink sheet. Uh, you will be given five minutes to speak. The board, according to board policy, will not be able to respond to your comments, but we thank you for your comments. Would you read with me the mission statement for the Marshalltown School District? We develop learners who have the knowledge, skills, and positive mindset to successfully pursue a meaningful future through personalized learning experiences. And stand as you're able to join me in the pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any changes or adjustments to the agenda? Yes, we have uh, three adjustments and changes. We are going to move Emily and Phoebe into the recognition category for their presentation, and then we'll come back to the agenda item later in the meeting to approve the out-of-state travel. So they'll, uh, the presentation will be 103. And then we have an additional donation for MacDine in the amount of $2,280 for the modular tech curriculum. Uh, with new programming at Miller next year. And then we need to interject the student board reps last presentation into 4.03, so we'll shift everything down from there after that presentation. May I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Harris Heitman? Sir. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same? The motion carries 7-0. Potter. Introducing Emily and Phoebe, both seniors, Marshallstown High School. They just recently uh, won, well, won two winners of the state senior performance category, and so they're going to go on to the hopefully go on to the uh, national contest in Washington D.C. We'll talk about that later. Um, their performance is on Emily Dickinson. This is a year-long process they've gone through. Um, history Day every year has a theme. Their, this year's theme was Triumph and Tragedy in History. Um, so they started by picking a topic. After the topic, they started researching and researching and researching, came up with a thesis, uh, found lots of evidence to back their thesis, wrote a script, practiced their script, found some props, and put it all together for a great um, National History Day performance. So we hope you enjoy it. Sorry. Sorry to everyone behind them. <laughs> They're doing this for the camera, unfortunately. So we'll have to look at their back. Maybe maybe they can turn around. <coughs> My name is Emily Miller. And my name is Phoebe Osgood. And this is Pardon My Sanity in a World Insane, The Life and Legacy of Emily Dickinson. 
Many artists experience debilitating circumstances that they must rise above to become the influential creators that they are. It is widely known that Emily Dickinson experienced a life of seclusion, alienation, and rejection. Issues within her family and personal life and her failure to see her poems reach the point of recognition that they are in today were all personal tragedies that impacted her up to until her death in 1886. In spite of these obstacles, Emily Dickinson was able to pioneer the profound and unconventional style of poetry that she is famous for today. Before her death, my sister Emily asked me to burn all of her letters and poems, but I think that her brilliance needs to be preserved forever. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'd advertise, you know. Hello, my name is Lavinia Dickinson, also known as Vinnie, and I'm Emily Dickinson's younger sister. It's only now, looking back on Emily's poems and letters, that I'm able to finally get a grasp of who my sister truly was. I remember much of our childhood. I enjoyed growing up in Amherst, Massachusetts very much. My name is Emily Dickinson, and I remember things a little bit differently than my sister Vinnie. I remember that during the 1800s, Amherst was a melting pot of cultures due to northern abolitionist movements. Whites, blacks, and other races were living in the same town at the same time. Our father, Edward Dickinson, was an ambitious political figure in our community. Our family was considered a part of the upper class section of Amherst. Because of this, we were given an extensive education as children. As we were growing up, social reform was a unifying threat in society. My sister was especially interested in the transcendentalist and suffrage movements, although she never quite got involved in them herself. I did read transcendentalist works, like works by Ralph Waldo Emerson and Walt Whitman. I also enjoyed reading books by famous female authors like Emily Bronte and Jane Austen. My sister also told me about the abolitionist and feminist movements as she heard about them. And along with that, the Civil War raged on in the later parts of our lives. My sister's life was marked by grief, and it came in the form of many things. Alienation from our family and schoolmates, health issues, religion, and loss. All of these added up to cause extreme isolation throughout her entire life. As children, we both attended Amherst Academy. Emily very much enjoyed her education and took it seriously. Well, school was just fun for me. After Emily graduated, she was sent to the boarding school in Mount Holyoke. Here, she began to struggle with religion and social acceptance. Vinnie, let me tell you a story about what happened to me while I was in school. All of the young women were separated into three groups. Those who were Christian, those who expressed hope, and those who were without hope. I, along with about 80 other girls, were placed into the latter category. By the end of the year, I was still in that category with about 20 other women. Emily never fostered a love for religion or religious practices, much to the disappointment of our family. I feel that the world holds a predominant place in my affections. I could not give all up to Christ were I called to die. Mary Lyon, my teacher, asked all those who wanted to be Christian to rise. I remained seated. I was the only one. They thought it queer that I didn't rise, but I thought a lie would be queerer. Because of her unusual ideas, Emily was often excluded during her school life. She wrote many letters about her feelings of isolationism to her older brother, Austin. Dear Austin, why is it that some of us are so different from the others? It's a question I often ask myself. Emily continued to find it difficult to return to a normal society after she came home from her schooling. While living at home, my sister refused to participate in the Calvinist religious practices that our family regularly performed. Calvinism relies on the aspect of predestination, the idea that God has decided who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. My sister rejected this idea, and our fanatic mother became incredibly distressed, causing their relationship to deteriorate. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home with a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome. However, as our mother's health declined, Emily had to take on the role of a caregiver. Though Emily loved our mother very much, this role ultimately caused a further strain on their relationship. My mother does not care for thought. Could someone tell me what home is? 
I suppose a mother is someone whom you hurry to when you are troubled. After we received our education, Emily and I were expected to become the keepers of the household, never being able to go out and make a life for ourselves. God keep me from what they call households. I don't see much of any, for she's mostly dusting. Our relationship with our father Edward was also a tumultuous one. Our father had strong beliefs about the roles of men and women in society. My father's heart was pure and terrible, and I think none other like it exists. In 1882, my family found out about our brother Austin's affair with Mabel Loomis Todd. My sister felt betrayed by our brother's infidelity, especially since his wife was her best friend, Susan. However, we were forced to keep silent on the issue. All of these circumstances allowed Emily to feel alienated from her own family, leaving her alone for most of her life. I am standing alone in a rebellion, and I am growing quite careless indeed. Later in her life, Emily's health, both mental and physical, began a steady decline until her death in 1886. Oh, Vinny, we need to have a visit with the doctor. My eye is in a terrible pain. Of course, Emily. I'll let Father know. Maybe a walk in the gardens will help you feel better. No, I would rather stay in. I've been feeling quite melancholic lately, and I think the place that I'm most comfortable is right here in my room. In fact, Emily grew so ill that she was practically bedridden for the last few years of her life. From there, her isolation began to drastically affect her poetry. It was not death, for I stood up, and all the dead lie down. It was not night, for all the bells put out their tongues for noon. Later in her life, death was a common theme. Our father died in 1874, our mother died in 1882, our favorite nephew Gilbert died in 1883. However, my sister triumphed over her personal tragedies through her poetry and stayed true to her own unique writing style. The soul selects her own society, then closes the door to her divine majority, present no more. After a long struggle with her illnesses, on May 15, 1886, my dear sister Emily passed away. I heard a fly buzz when I died, and the stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. Though Emily Dickinson is known today as someone who struggled with the personal tragedies of seclusion, death, and religion, she's also known as someone who changed the style of writing poetry forever. I discovered many of her works after her death in hand-sewn books and fascicles. These fascicles contain nearly 1,800 poems. I wanted my sister's brilliant mind to triumph in American literature and be remembered forever, so I dedicated the rest of my life to preserving my sister's poems. My new use of poetry began to spread across America. Other famous poets like Sylvia Plath and E.E. E. Cummings also wrote about their feelings in death and also employed unique line breaks and punctuation, much like I did in my poetry years before. People say that I, along with Henry David Thoreau, solidified the stylistic elements of American literary standards. Though Mabel Loomis Todd and Thomas Wentworth Dickinson published the first selection of Dickinson's poems in 1890, a complete edition did not appear until 1955. Edited by Thomas H. Johnson, the poem still bore the editorial hand of Todd and Higginson. It was not until R.W. Franklin's version of Dickinson's poems appeared in 1998 that Emily Dickinson's original spelling, punctuation, and line choices were completely restored. The great thinkers of the world rely on their independence and uniqueness. This is why Emily Dickinson is noted as one of the most influential authors in American literary history. Though tragically, Emily did not get to see her poems recognized during her lifetime, Today, we appreciate her triumph in poetry. Are there any questions from us? No, from oh, I'm sorry. <laughs>
on behalf of the district to get a uh, certificate of appreciation. We're very proud of your accomplishment at the state level, and we wish you the best as you move on to nationals. So, congratulations. Thank you. Hearing none, the public hearing for the 2018-19 budget amendment is closed. Moving on to the consent agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of May 6th? Mr. Spaghettis, are there any items of note and personnel? No. Looking at interagency agreements and contracts, we have uh, an agreement with Kaboom for the playground at Woodbury Elementary. We have asbestos removal at the high school in Hoagland. We have a contribution from Mechdyne to to the lab, to the lab. And um, a roofing contract for the west half of Franklin Elementary. We have um, a stack leadership facilitation um, contract for a two-day workshop. We have work-based learning advisor position um, added at the high school. Are there any questions regarding the <coughs> items? at open enrollments, we have two in, two out. For the remainder of this year, and we have one out um, for next year in kindergarten. Are there any items of note in bills? Looking at the donations, we have uh, Marshall Tom Company, Twenty-eight fifty-five donation for the modular tech lab and a grant from Modern Woodman in the amount of five five hundred dollars towards the marching band. We are being asked to approve project research um, for the evaluation of writing growth among students in grades K one through six uh, with the Iowa Reading Research Center. Any questions on the financial report? May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Okay. Harris Hernandez, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed the same. The motion carries 7-0. Remember you Jasmine. 
Jonathan Hazen, and I am a reading specialist at the elementary level. It may be hard to tell, but I've actually been in this district for 24 years now. My first 13 years were spent as a student, and the past 11 have been spent as an educator. I'm a proud product of the Marshalltown school system, and I chose to come back in order to help others do the same. During my time as a student, I was fortunate enough to have some of the best teachers in our district, including Lori Diggins, Elizabeth Overstake, Connie Mogart, Brad Weidenauer, Brett Lee, and Cheryl LaVille, just to name a few. They were, and still are, great, because they were able to focus on their students. I'm sure there was plenty going on in the background that I didn't know about, but they had faith in a system that also had faith in them. When I started in this district, I was a quarter-time title teacher employed by the district and placed at St. Henry, now St. Francis. Some people were shocked I would take such a job, but I knew Marshalltown was a difficult district to enter because of its high standards. I wanted to get my foot in the door any way I could. I knew I would be pink slipped at the end of that year, but just like my teachers in this district, I had faith in the system that I would be taken care of somehow. Now in my 11th year here, it's harder to have that same faith. I have faith in my students, in my teaching, in my colleagues, and in the leaders of my school. But when I hear about what is happening with our contract, my faith has begun to waver. By moving permissive items to a handbook, you take away the security of each and every educator in this district. When you take that security away, effectiveness will follow. On the wall to my right, you have a sign that asks if each and every decision you make is what's best for students. Unfortunately, it's hard to see from your vantage point, and I think it's fallen victim to the old saying, out of sight, out of mind, as have many teachers in this district. Removing permissives is not what's best for students. It puts teachers in a place of insecurity, and when a person feels insecure in their job, their effectiveness will lessen. Worrying about what may change from one day to the next, having no voice in their own profession, can cause a teacher to lose their creative edge. When that effectiveness and creativity falls, so do students' scores. If you truly want to do what's best for kids, take care of the professionals who are with them day in and day out. Make sure your teachers feel heard and appreciated, and they will share that same respect. Thank you. teaching in the district. Before that, I student taught and I was a sub here. I currently live in Ames and commute every single day and I have done so for the past six years. Most of the time people ask me, do you ever get tired of the drive? My response to them is always the same, no. I don't get tired of my drive because it helps me get ready for my day and wind down in the afternoon. But most importantly, I love my job. I love where I work and I love the people and kids that I work with every day. My commute is 52 minutes, whether it is a school day, a weekend, a day with bad weather, or in the summer, and I'm always early. I spend my own summer break working in my classroom, getting ready for the beginning of the school year to help meet the Marshalltown Community School District mission and vision. Every single teacher, whether they commute or live in town, strive to be the best we can be. That is why we are continuous learners and continue to stick around even when we feel as unappreciated as we do. By removing permissives from the contract, you run the risk of creating an uninviting environment, especially for those of us who commute daily. Over the course of the last four meetings, you've had 25 teachers resign. I cannot say for sure how many commute, but I find it, find it unlikely that those who do commute would want to continue to come to a place where they no longer feel valued. I encourage you to keep the permissives in the contract and show our staff that we are all an asset to the district. Thank you. Hello. Uh, before I came, I was 
sick, I probably should go home. So I'm here against sound medical advice. Luckily, I'm hopped up on Advil and Diet Coke. So uh, I'll try to make it for the next four or five minutes. But I'm here because you know I teach social studies at Miller. I've been in education for a long time. And I can honestly tell you, most of my adult life has been in the service of something bigger than myself. I've had some of you in my classroom. I've had some of the kids in the classroom. Some of these kids who were here presenting were sitting over here were in my classroom. And I, I really, really, really believe what I teach. I believe in democracy. I believe in looking out for the little guy. I believe in standing up for yourself. And I can't ask kids to be a self-advocate, or I can't ask kids to be active in their communities or to stand up for what's right and look out for people who can't defend themselves unless I'm willing to stand up and do it myself. And I think anytime you come up here, you put a target in your back. But I'm here because what we are here to complain about or concern about or whatever, however you want to say it, it's important. I don't have a speech prepared. I don't have a litter in front of me. But I can tell you, everything I'm going to tell you is either blunt and it'll be professional, kind of. Um, <coughs> You know, every day when I go to work, I'm asked to do a lot of stuff. I, I rarely get a planning period. I give up my lunch break more than half the time. I have meetings almost every morning when I come to school where I have duty. I have to, sometimes I have to wait till kids are away from the building before I have a chance to actually go to the bathroom. And I'm not complaining because I have a mission. And when I joined the Marine Corps when I was 18, there were two leadership things I learned as an 18 year old. Number one, complete the mission. Two, look out for your troops. Welfare of your men. And I'm here because I'm doing what I got to do to support my administration, my central office, the school board, every single day. Me and everybody in my building does that. But I'm worried that we're not being supported, even though we're doing what we can to support what you guys need us to do. We're here for the kids. I believe in what I do. But I don't trust someone who says, trust me, when they want to take away things and they have no financial bearing on this district out of a contract and put in a handbook. You know, last year my brother passed away. And when he died, I was denied part of my bereavement leave. It was in my contract. I found my brother dead on his couch. This is the guy who helped raise me, five years older than me. Now, it was addressed, I think. But it was addressed too late. And I lost an opportunity to, 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 to grieve properly. And all I asked, all I asked in the end was I wanted an acknowledgement that a mistake was made, and I just dearly, dearly want to make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else again. And I didn't get those. So when people say trust me, I, I struggle with that. I think a lot of well-intended ideas start out sounding great, but if they're not in writing, they're not in writing. We're asking. We're asking, we're begging the board to look at this permissive language. There's so many things we can't negotiate for. There's so many things that, that we, we don't have the ability to advocate for. We want to come to work. We want to look out for these kids. We want to do what's right. We want to, we want to carry on the mission. But we also want to know we're supported. And like I said, I get what you guys are trying to crunch numbers. But I'm sorry, taking away uh, uh, the grievance process or, or nibbling away at a, a teacher's right to uh, uh, have due process and, and basic things that don't cost the district a dime. Why is that an issue? Why do we have to change what we do? I don't, I don't understand. Please help me understand. I know you can't ask me right now. I get how it is. But somehow, some way, help us understand why that's okay and how that's going to further the mission. Because it's not taking care of us. It's not taking care of anybody in this room. And I can promise you, I can promise you, for a guy who spent his life looking out for the little guy, this is not how I would do it. Thank you very much.
Our building has been using the book The Leader in Me to help us not only become better leaders for our students, but also learn how to help our students become better learners, leaders themselves. I believe that leadership comes from the top. Are you showing leadership qualities? Are you leading by example? Are you asking yourself what's best for our students? This handbook proposal is going to negatively affect our teachers by stripping us from our leadership capabilities and removing our voices from the district. This will in turn negatively impact our students as we will not be able to lead by example in that aspect any longer. So again, are you asking yourselves, is this best for our students? A good leader is going to work with members on the team to accomplish a common goal. A good leader is going to follow through with their commitments. A great leader is going to strive to build up our already amazing teachers to ensure them that they are a valued part of this leadership team because that is what's best for our students. Thank you. document. By law, the school is required to fulfill what has been agreed upon in this IEP. Nothing can be changed on this child's plan without first bringing the team back together and discussing if the changes are going to be what is best for the child. The team consists of students, parents, gen ed teachers, special ed teachers, principals, AEA reps. It can also include school counselors, occupational therapists, school nurse, and speech teachers. I ask you to think about this. Are you the board leading by example by this handbook proposal? Would you be okay with me taking a child's IEP, a legal document, and placing some or all of their legally binding accommodations into a handbook, a handbook that I could change at any moment's notice without a need of discussing it with the team? Of course you wouldn't. That would not be what is best for the child. Your handbook proposal is also not good for the child or the teachers. Just as an IEP provides a child security in receiving their needs, a contract with permissive gift, your teacher security for their needs. Now I ask you again, are you leading by example? Are you doing what is best for your teachers? reconsider a multi-year contract. I, as well as many of the other teachers behind me, would uh, greatly appreciate your support in that way. Furthermore, I am still left with several questions that have yet to be answered. Who has oversight of the handbook? Will teachers be notified of changes to the handbook? What is wrong with the current language in the contract that it would need to go into a handbook? My most important question, though, is why are these changes happening? What about our current language no longer serves the district well? I believe that many of the teachers in attendance tonight agree that moving our language into a handbook terrifies us. The students in Marshalltown need us to be productive teachers. After all, having productive teachers is ultimately going to make our district a better place. So, why not keep us productive and keep permissive in a language contract? After all, how can we put students first if you're putting the teachers last? Thank you. Hello. My name is Laura Fricky, and I have taught a Lenihan Intermediate 
for 13 years, I am having my best year in teaching. I love my teaching job each and every day. In addition, I have the pleasure of working with many talented teachers. My colleagues and I coached a Labor League team that was recognized at Iowa State. We started Linehan's first 4-H group, and we are currently planning, planting a community garden at, at Linehan. I chose this profession. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Okay. I chose this profession primarily to have a positive, fruitful impact on the youth of our community and at the same time provide for my family. I accepted this responsibility and its challenges to shape and educate our children and the future of our community. A healthy education system impacts the economic welfare of a community. With that being said, I feel it is my duty to share with you how recent decisions made by this board are impacting this district and to ask you to consider how your vote to dismantle the teacher's contract is impacting Marshalltown's future. You'll be asked to accept my colleague's resignation. At some point, she accepted a new job last week. I will use her as an example. In March of this year, teachers were informed of significant changes in the cost of their health care coverage. This has had a dramatic fiscal impact on the households of your educators who were provided with very little notice. This announcement is a very stressful event for your teachers in Marshalltown. My colleague, a master teacher, who was a single mother of two, couldn't afford the increase in the cost of health care for her and her two children, which amounted to a 14% reduction in her pay. She was forced to consider alternatives both in and outside of education. Last Wednesday, she secured a position in a nearby school district that was happy to accept her 21-year tenure. Her salary package with benefits amounts to a 9% pay increase and a much more lucrative benefits package as some other surrounding school districts offer. This is one example of many teachers that have been forced to look at alternatives to provide basic necessities for their families. Little Lenahan alone has seven teachers leaving our district only one of which is retiring. The insurance announcement is a very stressful event for your teachers in Marshalltown. The recent announcement to take away important provisions like work hours and leaves of absence, which have been covered in our contracts for many years, is extremely concerning to teachers. If you value your teacher's time, talent, and knowledge, why wouldn't you want to have contracts that assure them of continued security? Why wouldn't you want to promise to have open collegial dialogues with your team if you value them? Why would you seek to silence the voice of your teachers, who are the only staff members who connect face to face every day with your children and future Marshalltown citizens? If you silence teachers, then you silence the voice of your children. I respectfully ask that you vote for me. Voting to renew our contract, or voting to renew our current contract negotiations for the next three years, as we have done for many years, offers me the security to know there won't be any more surprises, like health insurance that I have to worry about for myself and my family. Then I and other teachers know that our basic needs will be will continue and we can focus on our jobs and taking care of Marshalltown's children and be partners in building our community of educated citizens. Your vote to continue with our past contracts for another three years shows that you value and respect the professionals that care for Marshalltown's youth every day. I thank you and I ask for your vote. Jacobson and I am a second grade teacher at Woodbury Elementary. Thank you for providing me with this opportunity to speak with you all tonight. This is my 29th year of teaching and my 13th year in the Marshalltown Community School District. Growing up in Marshalltown, I've been a bobcat for my whole life, despite teaching in other areas. My parents were both teachers in the district, proud teachers in our district, and put in 55 years combined together. They were so proud to teach for the Marshalltown Community School District and I was proud to go to school here from kindergarten through 12th grade. I am proud to now teach in this district. 
I am proud to work with caring, compassionate, and knowledgeable colleagues who want the best for our kids. I am proud to work side-by-side -side parents as we brainstorm with their child needs. I am proud to work not only for the district that I grew up attending, but for the district that my parents had worked in for many years before. I am proud and I am also town strong. I am proud of my community that weathered the devastation of a tornado, but immediately accepted and adopted the motto of being Marshalltown strong and works every day in one way or another to improve our community and to make it look as beautiful, if not more beautiful, than it was before. I am proud of my community that loves, cares for, helps, supports, and takes care of our families in time of need. We are truly Marshalltown strong. But changing the contract does not make me feel Marshalltown strong. It makes me feel unvalued, unsupported, and uncared for as an employee of a district that I love very much. Please reconsider and don't change this contract. This too is something that can be worked on together as proud Bobcats do to be Marshalltown strong. State field trip to College Park, Maryland for Phoebe Osgood and Emily Miller, June 9th through the 13th for the National History Day contest as presented. So moved. Carter Fletcher, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same. The motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Well, first of all, we just want to say thanks for having us. Uh, we are excited to be wrapping up our first year. Um, I'm Katie Allison. I'm the 11-12 specialist at the high school. I'm Austin Hauser. I'm the 7-8 specialist at Miller Middle School. Um, so what is IJAC? IJAC stands for Iowa Jobs uh, for America's Graduates. It's a private national nonprofit uh, corporation that has been around since 1999. Uh, one of the important fun facts for you, 94% of the students that are in the program um, graduate from high school, and 24% of them are first generation graduates in their families. Um, so the program is very beneficial. Students grad, or grade point average increase by 0.3 each year. And then as of this year, we are serving roughly 2,800 students and with that being said, there's 49 programs that um, IJAG's involved, which is, includes 35 schools in the state of Iowa. So uh, you probably are wondering kind of what we do in our classroom. So we have 37 core competencies that we teach. 
Um, a lot of those are leadership skills, team building activities, uh, employability skills, soft skills, things to really prepare them for the workplace. Um, we do all of our things through project-based learning, so um, a hands-on uh, learning approach instead of just standing and talking at them. Uh, we practice trauma-informed care, which we find very important. Um, if they stick with us for a whole year, they receive a full credit, which is awesome. And we are really just working to prepare um, the kids in our classrooms to be active participants in the workforce. Uh, we are also a need-want-benefit program, so uh, we can make anybody need the, the program. They have to meet five of our barriers. Uh, that could be that they're not proficient in math, language, things like that. It could be that they are the main source of income for their home. Um, maybe they are parenting already, uh, things like that. And then they have to just want to be there to really benefit from our program. Um, so one of the things that we have to do as specialists in each program has to do, we do a progress report each month. And in that progress report, it's on an Excel spreadsheet um, for us to kind of see out in front of us. And then our program manager oversees that. And then in that progress report, is uh, how many days our IJAC students were absent for that month, how many numbers of Fs they have for that month, and then also behavior referrals to the office or if they get, got a write-up um, that month. So again, we do, we do that. We started in August, um, even though there's only about a week in August, and then we've done it all the way up to this time, and we'll end it in June, so we do that every single month. Uh, we also do what we call principal reports. So every month we take the amount of Fs, the amount of absences, and the amount of behavioral referrals. We put it into a pretty spreadsheet for you guys to see the progress that we're making from month to month. Uh, we also add a little snapshot of what are we doing in our classrooms, what employers have we brought into our classrooms, what kind of team building activities are we doing, and then we try to add some pictures in there so that you guys can really see what we're doing in our classrooms. Uh, another thing that we do, we have a website that we have to enter every day, and that is ENDMS. And that's kind of our daily log of what we do in the class that day. We give a brief overview of what we did. We uh, select the competencies that we did for that day. And then we also mark the students that were there or were not there. So we recognize which students are getting which competencies when they are in that class for that day. And then another thing for IJAG is, so we're first year program here at Marshalltown. Um, so next year, since I have seven and eight grade, so I will follow up with the eighth graders even though they will be in the high school. Even though they're not technically with me, I will follow up with them each month just to kind of catch up, see how things are going, you know, how are classes, you know, have you found a job yet, um, and just kind of how everything's going on. And then uh, Katie will do that with her 12th graders that she has now, even though they may be getting a job or they might be in college. Uh, that is our responsibility to kind of follow up with them once a month after they are um, through with us. Here's an example of those principal book reports that I was talking about. So we have a nice graph up there showing um, the absences, behavior referrals, and Fs. Um, that was a, a strong month for us. Uh, we always like to attach some pictures. Those ones are from our legislative days, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we kind of tell you just what's happening. Um, and you get those each month. We kind of shoot them out to the staff and our principals, and we'll hang them up in our classrooms and things like that. So each program kind of sets a day aside during the week uh, for AR day, which is Academic Remediation Day. And that day it's not a study hall because we give our students a goal sheet, AR goal sheet, where they have to take responsibility and ownership of getting onto their infinite campus, writing down all their classes, what grade they have in each class, the number of missing assignments they have in that class, what those missing assignments are. Uh, because at the beginning of the year, um, especially for middle schoolers, Mr. Hauser, can you just look it up for me? I mean, I could, but the point of this is for you guys to kind of have it out in front of you. You guys have to look it up to see, you know, if you have an F in this class, okay, you know, and what do I have in this class instead of. Um, so I make all my students do that, whether they're straight A's or all F's, they have to fill out the school sheet. And um, then if they do have a missing assignment or an F, they stay and they pick out a missing assignment and they start working on it for that class period. And if they get done, they move on to the next one and so forth. If a student has um, all passing class or passing all classes and doesn't have any missing assignments, since we are trauma-informed care, um, I have set aside in my classroom some couches and 
um, chairs that they like to sit on if they're caught up. So the last 20 minutes on those Thursdays, um, they go over there and just kind of um, have them to themselves a little bit. So, and then she'll tell you what she does on hers. Um, ours are very similar. They definitely get these sheets. Um, most days when they come into our classroom, uh, we, we practice trauma-informed care. So you can sit where you want to sit as long as you're being respectful. But on Thursdays, because we want to get them on track to graduate, if they have anything below a seat, we sit in a seating chart, I take their phones, and we really crack down and get to work. Uh, we've been learning how to write SMART goals, which has been really beneficial, and they get nice easy points for that. So it's a, a nicely structured day for us. So we do fundraising and community service for each of our programs. Um, each program is required to raise $350. The first $350 that we raise goes straight back into our program. It provides us a basic skills fund so that we can provide things for our classroom. Anything that we raise over the $350, we kind of get to spend to our liking. We, we could make jag polos if we wanted to. Uh, we could have like an end of year celebration. Or because I'm 11, 12, I could provide that to my seniors so they could use that to apply for colleges and things like that. So that's just one of the other things we're required to do. Another thing that each program has to do, each student in the IJAG program has to try to get a required amount of community service hours in, and that's about 15. Um, as you can see, the high school did food drive and trash days, and then at Miller Middle School, we um, did a fundraiser for uh, Animal Rescue League, and then we are also going to do a trash day as well coming up next week. So Miller Middle School, um, I just put together a couple slides of pictures and kind of what we've done throughout the year. Uh, so three events going into the year that were already set were LDC, which is a leadership development conference. This was in the Science Center in Des Moines. Uh, this was for our class officer. Each program for IJAG has eight class officer members um, that are selected from their classmates in IJAG, and they kind of oversee uh, the class or the position that they're in. Another one is the legislative days. That is at the state capitol building in Des Moines, which two students were able to go. And um, the last one was just last Wednesday. It is for seven, eight, nine, ten programs. It's called Jag Nation. That is at Camp Dodge. Um, and then some employers that came in and talked to us is the Animal Rescue League, ACI Mechanical from Ames, the Iowa Works out of here in Marshalltown, and then Sports Plus. And then up there is just some PBLs and activities that we have done uh, throughout the year. On the left are all the PBLs that we have done. And then on the right are activities, uh, team building, leadership skills activities that we have done so far throughout the year. And here are just some pictures. Um, far left is the two students that went with me to the legislative days. They did a great job talking to legislators and representatives, um, you know, thank them for funding and supporting IJAG and then asking for an additional uh, million dollars to the IJAG program and we did get that extra additional million dollars, um, so that was a great day for us. Uh, the top middle was at the Science Center for our LDC conference, uh, that was about a month or two into school, again that was for our class officers. Uh, just kind of our posters, donation boxes that our kids made for the ARL. Um, and then off to the right are just some pictures when we were doing some of our PBL work. And this is from last week uh, when we went to Camp Dodge. Uh, the two far pictures were geared up when we went to the Humvee rollover stimulation. Uh, they really enjoyed that. The middle picture was getting ready for rock, or rock wall climbing. And then again, just from Camp, or Camp Dodge, far left was all the group members that went with me that day. Again, rock climbing, and then far right after the Humvee rollover. And then just a few statistics. So first semester, I had 31 students. Um, for the new program for middle school, 30 to 35 students is where we we're trying to aim for. And then the average referrals per month was about four, and attendance was absent was 10 for 31 students. Um, second semester, it's actually, I have 41 students this semester, so uh, upped it by 10 students for second semester. And then obviously the referrals and attendance is not in yet because the school is not over, but uh, if we were to stop today, it would be the same estimate for the referrals and attendance, which is pretty good considering I have 10 more students this semester. 
All right, I'm going to really quickly talk on my program. So first things first, at the beginning of the year, uh, we sat down as a class and we wrote our expectations together. It was just a conversation of what does a good teacher look like, uh, what does a good student look like. We kind of wrote those expectations together. Everybody signed the expectation board. So just right then and there, we kind of started to build a mutual respect and a mutual trust for each other. And because we are trying to prepare them for the real world, um, they are graded every day on what I call hired or fired. So did you show up at all? Were you on time? Were you on task? Did you turn in the assignments necessary? And did you have proper phone etiquette? So this, right off the bat, we're saying, look, we're done messing around. We've got to treat this like a job because we're not going to be you know, slacking once we get into the real world. So that's just the first basics of how I start my class. Here are a list of some of the PBLs that we've done. Um, we all have a career association, and what's kind of cool about our career association is that we use voice and choice. So um, at the beginning of each semester, we kind of say, what do you want to get out of the semester? What are the skills that you want to work on? What do you want to take away from this? And we're going to implement that, and I'm going to pick out PBLs that are going to reflect those things. Um, some of our events are very similar. So our leadership development conference, legislative days, and CDC. Um, CDC was the most recent images that I sent out where six of my students went and competed against um, just over 360 other IJAC students. Um, we competed in things like public speaking, um, critical thinking, life math skills, things like that. Uh, they did so well and at all of these events we require our students to dress in professional dress. Uh, we teach them right off the bat that you're going to go make eye contact and shake their hands and we're really just using these events to prepare them for the real world. Then on the bottom there, those are some of the employers that we've had in my classroom as well. So here we have a couple pictures. This one over here is for um, ACI Mechanical. They offer a great apprenticeship for our students. Um, Sean Smith is their head guy. He's, he's a good partner of ours. He just won an award through us. And then we went to the Build Your Future Skills Trade, which I really look forward to taking all of my students to next year. Um, a very hands-on um, what can I do without going to college but still being successful? It was a really awesome event. This was at our CDC, our Career Development Conference. Um, we had some employers there that had some tasks for them to do. And then this is William. He competed in art and expression, so he just had to find a way that he wanted to express himself to the judges, and that was his job. <coughs> That is our president and CEO, Lori Phelan, over there with Rosie. Rosie hand drew and painted that banner back there for our Future Ready Iowa banner. Um, she really loved that. And then those are all the students that attended this career development conference. That looks so nice. This was for our leadership development conference, which happened just at the beginning of the year. That is our career association there. Um, that was just a time for them to learn how they could best uh, lead in their roles as a part of our career association. So we're wrapping up year one. Uh, we're excited about what we do. We're excited to hopefully bring on a 9-10 program as well. We have the bookends, and we would love to see them um, all the way through our program. So the first thing that we want to do is get more employers in there. The more employers, the better. Um, they usually generally just come in, tell us about their, about their business, but then they continue to come in, and they continue to build relationships with our students um, in hopes that at the end or by the time they graduate, they can offer them a job or offer them some other kind of support. So we look forward to bringing in more Marshalltown employers. And then the next thing, um, I think we've done a good job, and you know, teachers in the districts have done a good job kind of filling out since it's a new program. But just continue um, striving the understanding of what IJAG is or what we do. Um, just the community teacher involvement, even at the high school and then at Miller. Um, the more teachers we can get involved or know more about it, the better um, that would be too for us. So. And then as far as roster and program success, we are really looking forward to and really hoping for a 9-10 program. Um, it would kind of stink to have 7-8 come in and then have to wait two more years to get back into the JAG program. We have so much to offer them and we just really love what we do and we see the impacts that we're making and so we just wanted to come share that with you guys in hopes of a 9-10 program next year. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you. Questions for Katie or Austin? What do want? Were the students fairly equitably divided within your classes between 11th and 12th and 7th and 8th? Yes. Definitely. So, so um, they try to go half and half, um, same with uh, male to female ratio. 
Um, so we try to get um, the demographics kind of evened out for, for everything. So, yep, yep. And then, um, so for my seventh and eighth that I have now, so we have asked them already, you know, do you feel a need or do you want IDRAG and all my 41 students that I have currently this year, this semester, want IDRAG again for next year, so. We've already kind of put together a roster for our 9-10 program. I know that you had some IJ specific professional development, which is pretty high quality project based uh, through the Buck Institute, and you participate as much as possible with our professional development. Have you found at the high school an ability to connect in well with the Bobcat Ready initiative? Yes, definitely. Yep, I think I think that we would benefit from continuing to spread the word about IJAC so that we can continue to see the, the similarities from the Bobcat Ready to the IJAC program. I think that we're teaching very similar. How many days a week are you interacting with the Every day. Every day? Yep. Right, both Miller and High School? Yep. What's kind of cool about JAG is that our max roster size for next year is 50. So we're really getting that one-to-one -one individualized time and really being able to just kind of like tailor to their needs. Thanks. Other questions? I'll remind the board for purposes of the action item that um, <clears throat> what is being recommended for approval the additional IJ position for next year for 1910 as part of the overall plan that was presented to you a year ago. Um, at a minimum, we were able to expand so that we had 7 through 12 covered. Um, for the future, probably any additional expansion would be taken into consideration and desire or not uh, to want to implement an MLA as well. simple terms, uh, these are all students that uh, have barriers to success uh, for future graduation or post-secondary, but they're also students who have shown promise in terms of ability and particularly potential for leadership ability uh, when those barriers are removed. So uh, we'll definitely be uh, excited in the future to see the data and as you're able to track these Secondary May I have a motion to approve the MOE between the school district and Iowa Jobs for America's graduates in the amount of $22,500 to be paid from at risk funds? So moved. Here is Hernandez. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries six zero. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. beforehand to get gather some information about that what is happening with the egg dropping and then based on that we'll design a carrier and we'll test this out in class and write a report. And then XLP Olympics are going on so throughout the year the extended learning program students have been working on projects like National History Day like you just saw and then at the end of the year we're doing the XLP Olympics so in our classes we're competing against the other periods in challenges like science trivia, tallest newspaper tower, and daily brain teasers. And continuing in the classroom in composition, um, we're implementing liter literary analysis skills during the film study that we just started today um, called Camelot. And 
the sort of the plot around it is um, the marriage of King Arthur to Guinevere, and it's basically going through the back story of their relationship and how Sir Lancelot came into the picture. And um, his idea is to not only have his country be at peace, but other countries as well. So he kind of explains his um, theory and his problem, and we kind of just get a backstory of that. And we're currently tying this with Camelot. We're currently learning about legends, myth, and fairy tales. And after we're done with the film and after analyzing it, we're all going to come together and do a class discussion about this. And basically, we're going to discuss how different common experiences and symbols throughout the film can be um, seen and kind of just describing what these mean and how people don't really notice how this can um, help better understand it in other films too. Are you confident enough that you'll drop your egg on your own car? Uh, well, I haven't started my actual carrier yet, but... If Dr. Schutte brings his car, would you be confident enough? <laughs> if your graduation was contingent on your egg not breaking? No? <laughs> awesome job, guys. Every, every time. Yeah. Awesome job. It's nice Thank to have you guys. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. We have three more people lined up to take the We're here to give you some information about curriculum adoption for the guidance department. So just a little bit of background information for you. You know, as part of our Chapter 12 requirements, between every five to seven years, professional school counselors have to go through a curriculum adoption, just like we do for literacy, math, and other departments. The last time we went through the curriculum adoption, 
we select as the second step curriculum. As we look into now our current process, we went through a needs assessment. It took us two years to go through it. It began with having all of our professional school counselors go through what was called Counselor Academy. It was a really great experience for them to take a good look at the practices, what does research say are things we should be doing, um, what do their professional standards say you know, professional school counselors day should look like. And as we went through looking at this, we noticed the difference between what we had been doing and what we should be doing. So the process we used in going into this, um, facilitated by our area education agency friends, we reviewed the current research on social emotional development. We haven't had much time as this group to talk about CASEL. But CASEL is the um, federal level organization that does a review of social emotional curriculums and says here are things that not only have good research base to them but have evidence that they make a difference for kids. So that was the standard we were using to look at all of our curriculums against. As part of our Counselor Academy program, um, we went through a gap analysis to see what are those things that we need to be doing differently. And just to give you a little bit of exposure to the CASEL, these are the five domains of social emotional development. The CASEL recommends all schools work on, whether you're talking about um, all classrooms, all grades, all kids, or you're talking about kids with disabilities that have the most intense behavioral needs. So those are focused on self-awareness, social awareness, responsible decision-making, self-management, and relationship skills. So the process that we use, well, first of all, my name is Dee Burt. I'm the College and Career Readiness um, Curriculum and Professional Development. You can excuse my voice. I'm <clears throat> kind of losing it. But, um, so we use the CASEL information for the professional counselors to look at different guidance um, curriculums that matched up to our assessment information. And so during this time, we had vendors come and speak with the, um, the counselors as a group and give their um, chance to interact with the materials and also explain how it could be used. Um, the counselors also at that time were looking for different things. They wanted to see how the students would have student interaction with this um, curriculum. They also wanted lessons that were engaging but also reasonable length because there's only so much time allowed in the day to have these lessons. They also wanted instructions on social skills, managing your emotions properly, appropriately, how to build positive relationships with others, and address mental health. And I think another thing that this relates to also is those soft skills that we're wanting to teach our students to be college and career ready. Um, they also wanted supplemental materials that they could use for intervention materials for um, tier two and tier three for our students in need. <clears throat> So after doing that review, they decided that they liked the positive action curriculum because it emphasized the self-management, social skills, character development, and coping with mental health. These lessons are approximately 15 minutes long. They're very interactive. Uh, the materials are very easy to, to um, go through and decide you know, how, how best to use it for your students. They're also um, supplemental materials, so let's say that we find the council say there's a high need for something with self-management or social skills. They have other additional lessons that um, we can't possibly get through all of them um, that they can use, but also for small groups and interventions. It also aligned to their mindsets and behaviors. Um, as Matt said, they did a, an analysis of where their gaps were in that, and um, so we were able to do a cross-curricular thing and, and, and match up with every mindset and behavior, there was a lesson that aligned with it. So how will it be delivered? Um, first of all, the K through 8th professional counselors will provide guidance to our students as counselors, okay, every six days. So they'll be on the cycle that they'll be working directly with the students. The 9th through 12th curriculum will be delivered during the homeroom, so we will have to um, incorporate our homeroom teachers every six days to help um, give this um, positive action um, curriculum to the students. Um, at the beginning of the school year, we are going to have one day set aside just for the counselors to have an all-day training 
um, representatives from Positive Action will come out and actually train them. They've actually given us a, full, a half a day during Professional Development Day when we were making our curriculum map using Positive Action. They, they were willing to work with us through a Zoom and um, give guidance to our guidance counselors about that. So that was really great. There's over 140 lessons, and so obviously we cannot um, do all the lessons, but Positive Action had actually um, identified like 50 of the top lessons that you should go through. And so they've developed a curriculum map that scopes, has a scope and sequence, and this is K through 12 just for um, this. And at the end of next year of uh, doing Positive Action, we'll probably take some time to review it and see if there's additional lessons that we'd like to or, or change out lessons and review it again. So at the next board meeting, we'll be bringing um, bids to the board asking for your approval to purchase the Positive Action curriculum and the professional development that goes with it. The total cost will be $50,000 and it's paid for out of our at-risk budget. As Dee mentioned, we're also looking to schedule um, professional development trainers to come in, and we're looking at August 22nd to do that. And then we want to also make sure that our professional school counselors get time during professional development to work with it and interact with it. What questions do you have? And yes, I had to take an opportunity to off my puppy. So. <laughs> We approved the dropout prevention budget for next year, last December. This was included so this in that. Yep. Other questions? Next item on the agenda. Thank you. <laughs> so the next subject to talk about is our IOU survey. So IOU survey happens every two years. All right, Josh, it's not working for me. There we go. IOU survey happens every two years, and it's a state-managed survey across multiple departments and agencies. Um, we ask all students in 6th, 8th, and 11th grade to take it. There is a process where students can decline to do that, but we tend to have really good participation here. It's really lengthy, it has 218 questions to it, so it takes some time to work through. But if you look a little bit about our demographics of who took it, and our last administration was November of this year. So we had 329 of our sixth graders, 351 of our eighth graders, 261 of our 11th graders. And you can see the demographic split was fairly equal between males and females who chose to participate. Some of the other information I thought the board would want, because uh, I thought it was important, 19% of our students, they're living in one-parent households. 7% of our students are living in two-parent households. 4% are living with relatives. 6% 6 are living with friends or someone not related to them. So, you know, our family situations are different than a lot of communities. Looking a little bit about employment, we have 23% uh, of our kids who are working at least you know, somewhere between one to 10 hours, and we have quite a few working more than 10 hours. Hey Matt, do you know as a percentage how that is for sixth, eighth, and 11th graders? Is that roughly 80% of, of each grade that took it? It's a hard number, but I don't know how many kids are in 6th, 8th, and 11th. Right. Great. Just a second. I have the full IOU survey avail available. That's right. I mean, I'm just... It's 178 right. pages, so I could look it up for nope. you. Nope. Are, are you happy with it? About 75 at each level? 375. Or 400. In 11th grade? No, that's the 75-80% so participation? Probably not. Feel good with that? Yeah. Okay. We always hope to get at least 80%. Okay. So 
So the way we're showing some of this information, and I'm not going to go through every single one. These are just some things that we have teased out. Um, we show Marshalltown's information, and then as part of their reporting out, they take districts of similar size, and they compile the data and give us a comparison. So if you look at you know, some of the school attendance issues, how often do kids <coughs> skip or have skipped class, you can see how we're doing in 6th, 8th, and 11th grade compared to other districts of similar size. Perceptions about their home or neighborhood. Do they feel that it's a safe place to live? Are there people living in my home that have a serious drug or alcohol problem was really interesting. You know, we look about our demographics compared to other districts of similar size. Um, there's a fair amount of concern reported by our students in that area especially at the sixth grade level. Do they feel that their home is a happy place? You know, for the most part, you know, we look quite a bit like other schools our size. Are there clear rules at home about what I can and cannot do? They report mostly, but yes, there are. Switching over to thinking about the school environments now. During the last 30 days, a teacher had to stop teaching in order to deal with a major student disruption or behavioral problem. You can see that we have a large bump up as we move through into Miller, but that doesn't look very different compared to other districts of similar size to have that same jump in that eighth grade level. Our sixth grade level looks actually quite a bit underneath what most districts our size do. And then students reporting there are clear rules in school about what students can, can and cannot do. You can see that we look fairly similar to other districts. Um, our eighth grade numbers are showing an underreported compared to other districts of same size. Do their teachers care about them? Adults who work in my school treat students with respect. Again, you're seeing a lot of similarities across districts of same size. My teachers notice when I'm doing a good job and let me know about it. And my teachers are available to talk with students one-to-one. -one. If you look at the comparisons, we look fairly similar, other than there is a difference in eighth grade on teachers available to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Overall, I feel safe in school. You know, that's a real important question. If you look at that, even though we look fairly similar to other places, still, we would love for that to be 100% of our kids feel safe in school. You know, that is always the goal that we're shooting for. And then how well do kids try to do their best in school is reported. There's at least one adult at school that I can go to for help with a problem. And in the last 12 months, I've been threatened or injured by someone with a weapon while on school property or at school event. Even though those numbers may seem low, that's still concerning to us that there are incidents happening that often. In the last 12 months, I have carried a gun, knife, or weapon to school or to a school event. Again, even though we don't look that much different than other schools the same size, that still is concerning when you think about of the number of students we're asking this question to, somewhere between 3 and 5 percent say they have done this. Our next set of questions really talk about their perception of whether they've been bullied or not, and the IOU survey defines that for them. So in the last 30 days, have they been bullied at school? Really, it's a verbal sense. And then in the last 30 days, I've been bullied at school, and that's more around the physical part of it. And you can see how we look compared to districts the same size. Also in the last month, have I been bullied one or more times at school? And I've been bullied at school which was really about being made fun of because of race or color.
Moving into self-reporting about drugs, alcohol, and tobacco use at school. You know, in the last 12 months, have I used alcohol or other illegal drugs on school property? In the tw last 12 months, have I used any type of tobacco or smoking product on school property? So again, we're looking a lot like school districts are the same size, but setting that apart, we are still worried about the number of students that are self-reporting about this. In the last 30 days, I've had one or more drinks of alcohol, and in the last 30 days, I've used marijuana. Moving on to talking about mental health, self-harm, and suicide. So yes, I currently take medications so I don't feel angry, anxious, restless, nervous, or sad. You can see that we have a number of students who need medication to deal with those feelings. Also in the last 12 months, I feel sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks or more in a row where I stop doing some of my usual activities. And that's an indicator of early onset depression or anxiety. And even though we look a lot like other districts are same size in comparison, those are still areas that we want to work on here. More concerning, in the last 12 months, I've seriously thought about killing myself. And it's well defined in the question for the students. So if you look at that, um, as you get older and move through our system, they have thought about it more. And then the last question on this slide is really about a sense of, of hope. You know, I do not feel I have much to be proud of. 91% of our kids say they don't have much to be proud of in sixth grade, 82% in eighth grade. It's not that much different than we see in other districts, but kids are having this real lack of self-esteem when they're self-reporting is what that's showing. So there's a lot more information than what I shared here. What do we do with this information you know, now that we have it? Well, we compare it with other information we have about kids too. So the IOU surveys about how students self-report their perceptions, their beliefs, and their feelings. There's always a little bit of error in that because as much as we want students to always be honest, sometimes they are, sometimes they are. We want to compare that to our office referral data, what's going on with the students who are coming to the office, what are we learning about them, what do we know about their home situations. This year we've also begun through uh, Miller, uh, what's called SABERS, Social, Academic, and Emotional Behavior Risk Screener. And so it's a teacher report on are we seeing, seeing concerning behaviors around not only their actions in the classrooms, but some of that social emotional development around anxiety, fear, grief, uh, mental health conditions. And so we're comparing all this information. And really where it's taken us, and you'll hear more about this in our next board meeting when I present on district social emotional learning, is it's really helping us understand the impact chronic stress or trauma has on the brain. Being cognizant that our students have a lot of factors that influence their day to day and we need to keep that in mind. The importance of developing positive relationships with each and every student. Learning how to teach our students the way to better manage their chronic stress or trauma in a socially appropriate way. We have to relearn what we thought and what we understood about changing people's behavior. And we have to expand our relationships with our mental health providers and have a really good partnership with them so we can talk try to support kids across all settings. And a lot of these things that I just went through on what it identifies for us, you've heard before because when we did our book study about um, Eric Jensen's work on poverty, these were many of the things that were brought up. Well, like I said, the next time we meet, talk about some of the social emotional learning we've been focused on this year and some of the things we're planning to do over the next several years to try to address many of these issues. But what other questions do you have? I know this is a test or a, a 
or however you call it, that you've had many years, right? Every other year, it's happened for quite a few years, So yes. do you see any change in trends over those years? Our trends really bounce up and down, so they'll, I guess a couple things. First, every couple years, they change some of the tests. And so when doing that, you know, we have to think about this as kind of an end point of the old test and looking at the new one. So we have two consecutive data points now of the current test. Um, it's hard to do a trend over two data points, but if you look at projections over time, they do like most things. They bounce up and down and they come and go. Our district is very consistent on having the bounce. We're not having a steady incline or decline. Other questions? similar to what we have going on for the Chromebooks uh, to provide some reliable technology in the classroom that teachers um, know it's going to work for them. So many of the district's classrooms currently, their computers and projectors are aging. We currently have 320 desktops, uh, Windows PCs. They're older than five years and approximately 112 projectors that are older than six. So I've included a, a matrix here of our current inventory and what our estimated uh, cost would be to replace those based on current rates of those uh, devices. On April 17th, uh, I met with the Finance Committee to discuss this um, matrix and was tasked with, along with the Technology Department, creating a replacement plan uh, to present to the school board that would hopefully remedy some of these aging devices. So some of the goals for the plan were to replace uh, the Windows desktops every five years, replace the projectors every six, include computer labs in this replacement cycle, uh, reduce the total number of computing devices when possible, and stay within a $200,000 per year budget. The next larger um, matrix is the tentative replacement cycle that I and my staff came up with uh, for the next four years on funding and replacing of different um, technology devices. So for the first year, what we'd like to kind of do is replace the uh, short and regular throw projector uh, devices throughout the district. You can kind of see that um, we're requesting 280 mounts and not quite that many projectors. The reason we're doing that is throughout the year, this year, we have been replacing projectors that have been dying with uh, new Epson projectors but have not been replacing the mounts. The mounts, the current mounts that we have are on a swivel and those swivels are starting to not pull as well as they could and as well as the screws on those devices are starting to strip out so they're needed replacement as well. Also some of the classrooms don't have a uh, traditional mount and those new mounts will be used to replace those as well. Uh, the tentative plan for the following uh, 2021 school year would be to replace the technology primarily at the high school 2022 or 21-22 school year looking at the middle school and the 22, 23 in school year looking at the elementary desktops. Another reason we kind of looked at the projectors first um, is there have been some 
changes that I've been hearing in other neighboring school districts, uh, the possibility of replacing teacher devices at the elementary is not with a Windows PC, but looking at a more or less expensive Chrome uh, device in those areas. I'm hoping with the replacement and expansion of the teacher uh, Chromebooks, we can become a little bit more familiar with Chrome as an operating system in itself, and be able to survey the staff the upcoming school year to see if the Chrome devices would be a viable possibility to reduce some of the costs for the uh, 2021 school year. So what I would be requesting approval for tonight would be to publish an RFP for the purchase of 228 Epson projectors and 280 ceiling mounts. And the results of that uh, proposal would come back to you as soon as we received this. Questions for Josh? So Matt, or Josh, does this mean that uh, if elementaries have desktops that are three, four, five years old, it'll be four years before you get to them, the way this reads, that you're not doing? Well, the idea, um, when we start some of the computer replacement cycle, um, initially at the high school, if there's any device that doesn't meet the criteria for replacement, mm -hmm. that is, if it's a still usable machine, uh, the technology department would be re-imaging those computers, moving them to um, probably down to one of the other elementary, so we don't have to keep moving that computer around so much, but to kind of phase out the older computers throughout the district. Okay. So it's easier to do it building by building or area by area rather than by age? My preference is for building by building. I think you create a little bit more um, <coughs> of a standard across that building, a better expectation of what kind of technology is there. Obviously, I would love to be able to do everything in one uh, swoop, but kind of going at a differentiated level is um, the best. Trying to hunt down and identify every aged computer in that building, and it, it becomes a management um, issue. Sure. And I will also just for you at the finance committee, but is, is 200,000 of you, is that is that new? Is that we're spending that already anyway, just not in the organized fashion? Is that, I guess, we're, we're presumably we're at some at some level we're replacing outdated technology today. I guess is this a significant increase or just a different way of doing that? This two hundred thousand dollars per year is to come out of sales tax funds, kind of like the corner. Come out of sales tax. Just like the Chromebook replacement cycle is, but no, I don't think we do have an actual replacement cycle established. Not to, um, to not to the equivalent of like the Chromebook replacement cycle. That kind of became a priority um, getting that done. Some of this stuff is starting to age without a real good replacement. Yeah, but uh, so the answer is yes to most of the questions that you asked. Um, Shortly after I came and Josh, it was recognized that we didn't even have a cycle established for student Chromebook replacement once we had moved towards a one on one. So that was priority number one to get that established. And then this would be to do the same uh, with the adult devices and or technology so that we can have a plan, a reasonable plan over time to replace these things so we aren't always just dealing with it when it goes bad. So, um, and you know, to get a handle on, uh, in terms of the sales tax, you know, what amount of that needs to be devoted annually to technology versus facilities. But to um, Ross's question, so did a determination, how did the determination, how was it made when you got into 2020-21, whether we start at the high school versus starting at the elementary and that sort of thing, was that based, based on the age of the devices for the most part? On the, for the most part, not based on the age of the devices within that building. So uh, the elementaries tended to have slightly newer machines, so it would be less moving around of newer computers. As you have mentioned, as we move closer to um, 
middle school, intermediate, and elementary school if devices go bad and we look first as we normally would to can we repurpose uh, devices that have been replaced but are still usable or still have a little more life Correct. Uh, before buying a new one. And so did you say that we'd be piloting some Chromebooks at the elementary in order to make a determination? No, there are, well, uh, teachers will be getting Chromebooks for a renewal of Chromebooks this year, um, hopefully with the next agenda item, the copier um, projects. Uh, we, one of the big issues that teachers have with using Chrome devices are their inability to print currently. With the new copiers, they've allowed for Chromebook printing, um, and I'm kind of hoping that some more familiarity with the Chrome operating system, the usability inc increasing as far as copiers go, um, will help a possible transition if other school districts have success in piloting Chrome devices for teacher workstations. Other questions? Okay, I have a motion to approve publishing an RFP for the purchase of 228 Epson projectors and 280 ceiling mounts as, project, as presented. Second. Carter Fletcher, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. The motion carries 6 0. Thank you. All right, so my next agenda item is to um, discuss the bid tally of our uh, copy of movies project. Uh, just to recap, our current three year lease agreement with Advanced Systems expires July 1 of 2019. We currently have 42 district copiers with black and white printing capabilities. The cost of that, those copiers, is approximately $244,000. We get charged, um, we have an allotted amount of copies per month, and we are charged an overage if we go over those copies. Uh, the current copiers do not support Chromebook printing. Some of the goals of that project were to support color printing, support Chromebook printing, support better auditing capabilities, reduce the total number of copies, reduce the total number of items printed, reduce the number of laser printers, <coughs> personal laser printers, and eliminate inkjet printing. So the bid tally of the results, these numbers are factored on black and white copies of 525,000 per month and 67,000 color copies per month. Um, we've reduced the number down to 30 um, copiers per building and the way that the determination was made for that so it's trying to be equitable ac across all elementaries um, and getting one copier per building, reducing the number at high school, uh, strategically placing copiers uh, at distances not so close to each other, looking at um, current loads on copiers and eliminating ones that are were under a th certain threshold. So as you see before you, um, you have the bid tallies. And if you checked your email about an hour and a half before the board meeting, um, we had a couple of questions from a vendor that was questioning if the if it was a fixed lease amount for the 36, 48, and 60 month term. The advanced lease that I'm recommending, those numbers are fixed. Um, as well as access systems are fixed as well. The reason we are, or the reason that I will be recommending a 36 month copy per lease rather than a 48 or 60 is the fact that technology changes quite frequently. Um, also, the workload that we're putting some of these copiers on, it is nice to have the option knowing that they could be replaced in three years rather than trying to support them for 60 months. Some of the criteria that we use to evaluate these bids, certainly cost was a, a, a primary factor. Uh, however, uh, support services, um, familiarity with vendors, ease of use some of, of some of the products, and uh, familiarity, brand familiarity, all played a factor. It was a very close uh, decision between advanced systems and access systems. We currently have Canon printers here in the district. Toshiba printers are 
a printer that I personally have not experienced, nor is my technology staff. Um, finding reviews of Toshiba copiers online is difficult for the ones that were bid. So I'm very comfortable in recommending Access Systems as our copier vendor going forward. Advanced. For advanced, <laughs> my apologies. Lots of paid names. We've had great service with Advanced uh, the three years that we have had them. Copiers are not down very often. They're very responsive to repair inquiries. So Josh, we had 42 copiers in the past. We did. And we were paying 244000 Correct. And we're going down to 30 copiers and we're paying $50,000 more? Correct. So some of the costs, um, the print auditing software that we are receiving, uh, print audit was bid by all of these vendors. That is a software as a service. We are paying monthly for that. And also the enhancement of the color copying. That is a more expensive copier. Um, the existing ones can only print black and white. And that is a, um, my response, my responses that I received from teachers about the copiers, one of the primary concerns was color copy, um, being able to print color copies right now, the way the district has supported that. Historically, it was either through a personal laser printer or a inkjet printer, both of which costs much more to send a copy or click to that device than sending it to more of an enterprise grade. Copy and do we have an overage charge like we do with the old, old we, agreement? We do, yes. So the CPC color, that's CPC stands for cost per click. Those are the amounts uh, overage okay. for color and black and white. Right. Thanks. Tell me how we're able to decrease 250,000 copies a month. So the hopes is with new print auditing software and moving to digital platforms, um, investing in items like Canvas, teachers would be able to distribute electronic documents to students rather than necessarily print them out to a copier. And if we surveyed teachers and principals, would they support that? They have not been surveyed, so I could not make an accurate assessment. I think you should do that. Okay. If you're assuming that Chromebooks are being equally used the same in every classroom for the electronic copies, I don't think that's the case in the classrooms that I've been in. With the new print auditing software, principals would be allowed the flexibility to increase above and beyond the number of copies. What we're really paying for um, would be that cost per click. Or we're paying three cents per click. For a color copy, correct. Overage, where that's the cost per. So if we go over, as a district, the 525,000 plus the 67,000 a month, that is what we would be charged per color copy. Three cents. This auditing software is going to be able, unlike the past, for us to be able to pinpoint where these copies are being made. Correct. Right now, there direct is direct the cost to that current buildings to the departments and or the buildings or the, even the classroom. Correct. Right now, that auditing system is not in place. Anybody can send a job to a copier in any sort of quantity that they would like, and we do not have any way of identifying who sent that job to that copier, or limit the quantities that are being sent to that copier. Do you know if we're using our 785,000 copies right now? Currently we are not. Um, I would have to go back and get the uh, report exactly where we are sitting, but we have not exceeded that amount currently. Other buildings are more uh, high school, accounts for a good portion, elementary is not so much. Other questions for Josh? I have a motion.
motion to approve awarding advanced systems the copier bid for three-year copier lease and software agreement in the approximate total of $290,000, four hundred and seventy-eight and seventy-six cents as presented. Fletcher Hernandez, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same? Aye. Aye. Motion carries four two. Thank you. I would really like to see um, surveys of individuals who are directly involved when we're making district wide purchases like this.
just going to let you know that, um, am I on? Yeah. Okay. That um, we did go back and forth with the vendor to discuss um, a lens of equity to ensure that we were spending um, in equal proportions on what we used for CKLA at the other five elementaries and then what we were able to spend through Woodbury. Um, we also went back to the vendor and discussed that through this, um, through this program, the students have online access to some reading selections and they, because of their involvement in the dual English program, need to have that access in Spanish and in English. So instead of making us pay for dual licenses in that, they just did the one point of license for that. So there was a concession there to make sure that they honored our um, bilingual program. And then the reason that we're spending out of the ELL budget is because we're not doing anything in addition to what we're doing with our students in our other K through four buildings, like we do with English learners there. At Woodbury, we push in services because of the intensity of the saturation of English learners, the count of English learners that we have at Woodbury. So we use the same expenditure per pupil at that same rate to budget for that out of the ELL as well. This will be the first uh, Spanish curriculum we purchase in over 17 years. So um, when we purchased the last Grado uh, program, it was only purchased in English. It was not purchased for our Spanish program at our dual English school. So it's, it's our current materials and resources that we're using in Spanish are 17 years. Questions? Okay. Yeah, go. You feel good about it then? Is oh, yeah. Right? Okay. This, we really did. Okay. So it's 4.08 is the language studio materials that are for the EL students only at all the schools except Woodbury. Um, the total amount of that is $92,942.25 and those will be purchased out of the ELL textbook budget. Questions for Lisa? Presentation was made at the last meeting. May I have a motion to approve the requested purchase of CKLA language studio 
uh, with accompanying ELO materials in the amount of $92,942.25. So moved. Second. Harris Carter. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same. The motion carries 5 0. Our point 09 is um, a similar request to each that we presented. Erica Fenders was here with Alex Klein and Lizzie Stanton, presented information about the process we went through for the K5 literacy English materials as well as the sixth grade um, materials for our literacy program. Um, there was, uh, when I presented it two weeks ago, the original quote was $288,000. Well, anyway, the original quote, we went down $7,116, which was exciting news. The companies rarely reach back and say, oh, we, oh, we quoted you too high. Um, so that was a relief. Uh, so the um, request that we're asking tonight is for $281,313 from the curriculum textbook budget for English literacy materials and $35,700. Eighty cents, and that would be the sixth grade materials out of the curriculum textbook budget. Questions for Lisa? May I have a motion to approve the purchase of K five C K L A E L A? Good job. Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> in the amount of 231,313. In sixth grade, amplify ELA in the amount of $35,700.80. So moved. Second. Tighten Fletcher. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same. Motion carries six zero. Okay. And the next item that's mine also is um, requesting approval. We shared information only with you two weeks ago. The updated um, 1920 preschool handbook and all of the changes that were made were highlighted in yellow. Um, and all of those changes were based on feedback we got through the preschool desk audit from the Department of Education, as well as a few minor changes that we had. Any questions for Lisa? May I have a motion to approve the 2019-20 preschool handbook as presented? Second. Fletcher Harris, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. The motion carries 6-0. Thank you. Thank you. slides that we want to go through um, that really just talk about the benefits of the program. Everything that we do is presented to a board of school business officials who make the decisions about our programs, whether that be coverage that they need, improvements into the program, how to operate the program financially, and then we go out to the marketplace and find carriers that match up with those desires and who will provide those coverages. Um, the program is owned by the insurance member that is not owned by insurance companies, so we take the first portion of every loss and self-fund, and then any money left over that we collect at the end of the year is then returned, 
return back to members in the form of a surplus. So this really gives a lot of control to the membership as they go forth in terms of designing a program that they feel would be best. We do have group purchasing power. We're able to get coverages and, and influence in the marketplace to maybe design programs that are not the most popular or available in standalone situations. It is a long-term stable solution um, in regards to these programs have been around since the late 70s and early 80s, 30 to 40 years, and they're still in operation, you know, sitting on millions of dollars in surplus, which would formally be insurance carrier profit. Um, we did not have any members that were canceled this past year, despite the fact that the modeling in the Midwest has now changed. And when I say modeling, that's essentially all the data that different insurance companies use on the back end to determine what amount of premiums they need to collect based on the losses that they predict or foresee in the future, based on modeling of you know, 10,000 year losses, 1,000 year losses, 500 year losses, 100 year losses, et cetera. Uh, what we're seeing is that uh, tornado alley and hail storms, convective st severe convective storms are moving further north, away from North Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas, and now more into Nebraska and Iowa as well. Um, every year we improve the program. One of the things that you'll see last year is cyber. We, we were able to double our limit from one million to two million for all limits. We provided affordable options to increase to three to five million. That was requested by our members, specifically our larger members, because what they're seeing is that schools are becoming uh, more targets for hackers, as opposed to stealing 400 million contacts from Home Depot or Target and being in a pool or, you know, after you for the rest of your life, they find out that they can just go and get a school superintendent, fish an email, get the data, get access to the bank accounts, take money out, and if they make five to $10,000 a day in you know, rural districts around the state, around the country, that's a good payday for a hacker. Um, one of the things that we're seeing that is, is uh, very prevalent around the country, and this happened the day that we presented the renewal, was a school shooting in Colorado. I grew up uh, about 15 minutes away from Columbine High School and was in eighth grade when that happened. I actually had friends that went to the high school. So it was just kind of uh, coming full circle that this happened right down the street there. We've created a new product called Gallagher Crisis Protect that provides crisis consulting and basically fills all of the gaps for coverages that are not covered in an event like a Sandy Hook or Parkland. So Parkland and Florida is a client of ours and one of the things that the producer down there had figured out was that um, we really wanted to find a solution that solves the problem for if your school has a catastrophic or tragic event like that, but nothing actually triggers insurance, for example, um, in Sandy Hook, we have a classroom of students get shot and killed. You can't actually physically or mentally enter that classroom going forward, thus they had to move the school down the street, right? But there's no physical damage triggering coverage to say that we want to hold school over here and increase transportation costs, rent this facility, retrofit a, a former nursing home um, so that the bathrooms can be utilized by kindergartners, right? Those costs aren't covered, so we created a product that covers those gaps. We then take it to our membership, talk to them about the difference in coverages of what's available in the insurance marketplace, what coverages we bring to the table, and then the school districts vote on whether or not they would like to uh, proceed with those coverages. One of the things this year at Renewal that we figured out was that the property market globally really hardened. We've had uh, nearly 18, 18 months to two years of the worst losses in insurance history. Um, two days after the policy period started on July 2nd, many of your peers around Iowa were hit flood losses. Um, flying in on the plane today, coming in, the rivers are overflowing all the way through the state from Davenport to Des Moines. Um, carriers are just looking at their overall exposures and where they're exposed. You all are familiar with tornadoes with last year. Um, I believe that the courthouse was the largest loss to a local insurance company here in town of over $25 million for that loss. Hail is becoming more and more prevalent. Flooding is becoming more and more prevalent. Wind and strong convective storms, where the storm basically essentially blows through the entire state from north to south and takes out everything in its path. Um, what we're finding is that the global insurance market is tightening because of that. So here you'll see Hurricane Katrina and the losses were around $80 billion. In 17, it was $144 billion, and in 18, it was $80 billion. On April 5th, this was just an article that came out just talking about you know, the, the Midwest and the floodlands from Nebraska to Iowa, et cetera. So um, insuring school districts on 7-1 is nice because it corresponds to the school's district schedules. 
but from a um, underwriting standpoint and a brokerage standpoint, it's a really hard time of the year to go out and try to buy excess property insurance where um, I remember one year we, we brokered the deal, we had something on the table and Seymour got hit by the tornado later that night and our underwriter called us the next morning and said, I just got a call last night that one of your schools was to took a direct hit by a tornado. Um, you know, I believe your tornado last year was... 19th. It was what? July 19th. July 19th. So it, it is tough to, to see when that comes through. One of the things that our schools do is that, um, this is this is EMC, they write a lot of the school districts in the state of Iowa. They've got um, flood coverage where they cap their limits at $150,000. Our school districts realize that uh, from 93 to 2008, and you know again, this year, there's been pretty prevalent flooding in Iowa where it looks more like Minnesota. There's like 10,000 lakes all over the state. Um, they've decided that they want to up their limits to about $40 million, which actually covers our modeling for the program, $40 million worth of insurance. Uh, that's a big comparison between 150000 and $40 million, but it also comes with a cost. So when it comes to pricing, we're not as competitive as other things in the state right now when the models change and when the property market changes because we offer different coverage. If the group decided they didn't want $40 million of flood coverage anymore, we could come back and we could save money for the membership, but we leave that decision up to school districts in the state. The last time the market hardened like this in the 80s, Time Magazine came out and said, sorry, America, your insurance has been canceled. But really, there just wasn't options in the country where insurance carriers were offering insurance to public entities. We're starting to kind of enter into that same type of market. We don't believe it's going to be a fully fledged hard market, but we do start to see the very similar effects to what happened in 79. Here's your IPSIP property limits um, and the different modeling for severe and convective storms that we see. They're saying our average annual loss will be about $921,000 with the opportunity every 10,000 years to sustain a claim of up to $108 million. We buy $200 million in coverage within the IPSIP program, so more than nearly two times the, what we would consider Could you say the that again? Yes, ma'am. Because I heard you say 10,000 years. The return period for the critical probability is once every 10,000 10, years, there is the probability of having a loss up to $108 million in a worst case scenario. The 100 year loss is at 12.4 million. So what we do is we take this model and buy limits on behalf of the group. We have a $2.3 billion schedule with all of our members. We don't need to buy $2.3 billion worth of limits. We buy the limits that we need for the program. Our inland flood is showing that our losses could be up to $28 million for the group. Thus, we have $40 million in coverage. We also have $2 million in flood zone A. That basically essentially means that you're backed up to the river or to the dam, right? So you're in a flood plain. Um, both of those coverages have been utilized within the program. Here's your tornado risk map. One of the things that you're going to start to see is that I'm trying to get this stuff down in Iowa. You're starting to see that while you originally remember the tornado alley growing up, um, you know, and all the stories that you had as kids were right in here with Kansas and Dorothy, and now all of a sudden it's starting to move in Iowa and Illinois. This is the hail risk map. It basically takes up two thirds of the state. We're seeing very substantial storms in the lower left quadrant. Uh, we have three members in the lower left quadrant. Each in the last 18 months have suffered a million dollar hail loss or a million dollar tornado loss. So this is our excess property review just to give you an idea of what we do on behalf of our membership. We go out to the global marketplace and we look at options for insurance. We went out this year to over 50 insurance carriers to create 150 different program structures before we finally got to the quota share model that we have with five insurance carriers on the base layer of the quota share, each taking on a certain portion of that risk with XL insurance insuring the next 200 million. As a result of the property losses and the new modeling, the insurance coverage has increased uh, the premiums have increased substantially because they see Iowa as being a threat. They see Kansas as being even worse. We're seeing the exact same thing replicate itself in Kansas just south of the border. One of the things we like to do is we like to show you on your cost breakouts for the pool how much is actually paid in insurance versus fees versus loss fund or variable cost. Variable cost is monies that you can get back as membership. We like to consider it a dividend, but it's not a dividend because it's your money up front earning interest throughout the year, and whatever's left over of it is returned back to the membership. 
For work comp, you see the variable cost is nearly your entire spend. If no one in our program suffered a work comp loss, you'd get $3,006,502 back as a part of this. Now we know that that's not possible, but what we try to do is get everybody to get a work comp or a loss control mentality of how do I prevent claims from happening? How do I prevent the slip and fall? If I see a, a shadow that's created ice and I'm walking into the building and I'm all wet, my first thought is I need to get somebody out in maintenance to ice that spot rather than I'll wait for an hour until the sun hits it and it melts. Because if somebody slips and falls and it's a $200,000 shoulder surgery, it comes directly out of the $3 million, which could go back to the district at the end of the year. Our net position in the program is very positive. We have $1.5 million in profit or surplus that's uh, projected to go back to the school district based on our performance over the years. We have had seven catastrophic property losses um, within our program that include tornadoes, hail, flood. Uh, we had a bus fatality accident uh, at Riverside where the bus caught on fire and trapped a driver and a student as well. That's a large liability claim that we're looking at. What we wanted to show you is that of your overall increase, the fixed cost increase because of the market for Marshalltown is about an 18.9% increase. Obviously, you guys were the victim of a tornado last year. Your exposures and your claims history go into the pricing. But we also increased our variable cost a little bit because we're betting on ourselves. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, if the market thinks that you need to increase what you're paying them, we're going to increase what we're self-funding. And if we don't need it, we get it back. But if we do need it, that means that the market's right and the models are correct. And so that's how we operate our program. This is your overall increase for the 2019-2020 renewal. You'll see that almost all of this increase comes from property casualty. Your loss fund for workers' compensation is down. This really has to do with just the loss history in the state of the marketplace in the state of Iowa currently. So is that a <coughs> comparable increase on all members, Iowa members? Uh, you actually had a very competitive uh, increase compared to some because what we do is we run a debit credit model and a debit credit model is a way to basically say instead of rating each member in the pool individually on what they what they should pay right we run them together in a pool and then debit credit you so that we max your total swings um, you're actually locked in for the first three years of the program on a debit credit and so favorably in this situation it actually helped Marshalltown because I can say that as we get into the claims um, there are some situations that I think that we could really do to help address some problems within the district specifically with loss control and specifically in transportation controllable events right now you can't blow the tornado away from the school district right you can't control an act of God you can't control your drivers and that's something that we wanted to address I'm trying to move as quickly as one of the things, the power of working together, this is what you'll see when we founded the program with five members. We started with 10 million in coverage for excess liability. We're now at 20 million per district. So when you see costs increase over the years, these are proposals we put in front of your peers and let them make the decision to move forward with these coverages. We provided low hazard flood of $10 million. We've since upped that to $40 million because the school districts really feel exposed and we've had scenarios where people haven't had proper coverage and have had to dig out of those holes. Flood zone A, we had none. We have two million. Pollution, we have none. We have one million. Crime, we have 500,000. We've seen two districts with million dollar crime losses in the Midwest, one of which was in Iowa. It's possible to siphon a million dollars out of the school district without people knowing. We've seen it happen. Cyber, we had none. We've now increased it. You guys are all. Uh, Marshalltown is purchasing five million in coverage. So whereas before you may have been purchasing zero, you're purchasing five. So a lot of the the increase in pricing could be deceiving in comparison to maybe what uh, coverage was increased that year. Um, the big thing that we want to point out is that we have withstood multiple catastrophic losses, seven to be exact, with no member actually being canceled or being forced out. Um, I received a phone call the other day from the district who did have their insurance canceled on both sides, work copy and property casualty within, in Iowa, um, who is, has 61 days at the time to find a solution of what he's going to do for insurance on 7-1. Our goal and what our board has told us is never let a member of this program go without insurance. That's not a discussion that we're willing to have. Um, and so we just we create the best product that we can. The total fixed versus variable cost of our programs, 45% goes to insurance carriers or for fees. 55% is the opportunity to earn back as a program. This means 55% of your costs can be returned to the membership based on performance. 
Um, speaking of returning to the membership and base on performance, I do have some losses here that I wanted to go over because I was told to come with recommendations of how Marshalltown can best improve um, the district's performance. And your loss runs up a little bit different than some of your peers specifically as it relates to the transportation department. I've got, um, and I don't want to read them all out, but I've got some highlights on these two pages of losses from the 17 and 18 losses of property casualty. Every highlight was a bus incident. Almost 75% of them were bus making left-handed turn and clipped claimant's vehicle. Bus failed to yield it right away. Bus ran into the back of a car. Parking lots, minor dents, tear the bumper off, right? Well, the phrase in insurance is frequency breeds severity. I just lived through a fatal bus accident less than two years ago. I don't want to do it again. The number one time that this district is exposed is if all schools are in this building and an F5 tornado comes out of nowhere and hits the district, or every day when you fill up those buses with 60 kids and drive on Iowa dirt roads is the number one time that your district is exposed. I, we have uh, experienced in our office, my boss um, experienced the worst bus fatality in the history of the United States. States, or any bus was hit by a metro train in Chicago uh, and bore through it. It was a catastrophic loss with multiple fatalities of students, and we will never live through it again. As a result of the fatalities that we had, um, as a result of transportation and seeing some of the trends of what was taking place with transportation and distracted driving, because it's not always the driver's fault. About a month ago, I had a van cross the center line going 60 miles an hour and hit one of our buses head on. The van driver died instantly. The bus driver was airlifted to the point. It's not always your fault, but it does expose your kids. And so the one thing that we wanted to do proactively, outside of just the free loss control that we provide, you have unlimited free loss control. You have unlimited online loss control. You can go out and you can submit courses to your, to your teams. A lot of the times you think of LMS courses as being kind of the 1980s sexual harassment courses where the guy has long hair and he walks up to the lady at the water cooler. How effective is that, right? And so with the, what we were seeing with transportation in Iowa, we hired a company out of New Jersey to come in and present to the IPSA program on, um, I've got handouts for you that I can leave behind. Um, the company is called Transport. you have yeah, In addition to, they presented with us along with uh, at the ISBO convention, just a little bit. So the presentation is called Identifying and Managing Risk in Your Transportation Operation. They have created a custom program for Iowa schools that focuses on five things, management and staffing, consulting, fleet management, technology, and training. Uh, for a small fee of $2,500, they will come in and spend an entire day with your transportation department. We recommend that all schools conduct this in our program. We had a handful of schools actually execute upon this and be more than thrilled with the results on what they saw. Whether that just be the decision to outsource busing entirely, or whether that be a decision to you know, shorten your routes or make things more efficient. Um, this is not loss control that you can get from an insurance company or from a broker. This is specialized, number one, school safety bus transportation company in the country. Um, they have a staff of consultants that do nothing but consult for schools on transportation. Um, I would say that if I had any recommendation in leaving Marshalltown tonight, it's number one, cross your fingers that storms don't hit your district, and number two, it would be try to address your transportation issue, because I think that we're sitting on a ticking time bomb with the type of losses that we're seeing here. Uh, we are here to support you. We are here to bring in these resources. We are here to bring in these teams to help you solve these issues, but um, I definitely think that the transportation issue at Marshalltown uh, needs to be solved and needs to be solved quickly. And by solving it, I think that all we need to do is to address it, to start working on it, to start putting the boots on the ground and having people come in and, and run some reports and look at the data analytics and find out how are we having 20 plus auto accidents on a fleet of 50 buses in two years. That's a statistical improbability based on a benchmark of peers across the country. So. Does anybody have any questions that we can answer? I know that Mark is right down the road and is here to assist and help execute you know, anything that we bring forth today, but we really wanted to just come in and talk to you guys about what we can do to better, better the district and keep our students safe. 
And I did meet with Rex Kozak last Friday morning, and we're putting a plan together right now with the minimum of four, looking at four training days uh, spaced throughout the year, the first one being in the uh, week before school starts in August. So we'll uh, get that uh, figured out. If this, if this makes sense, we can look at that also. You know, a real shortcut is have them come in and provide a consulting day and present you with a 20-page report that identifies where are your critical problems internally and how can Rex actually address them, because they just may not know. So can they look at a district that has similar number of buses, drives similar number of miles? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. similar, they, have, they, they do a lot of outsourcing for, or outsource for busing across the country. Um, them and First Student are the two largest transportation organizations in the country, so they have all of those databases. Okay. And you said 20 accidents with 50 buses over a three-year time period? Over a two-year time period. Two-year time period, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks. You have about 20, and I'm just looking on the data as I could count for you. But. What was the cost of that? Uh, for, the, for the total incurred, subtracting the tornado damage, probably $50,000. But that's, that's one of the things that deceives us is that when you have the left-handed turn where you're pulling out at an intersection, it's maybe you pulled out and somebody got a bumper clip. I, it's better than pulling out in front of a semi and cutting a bus in half. That's, that's what we're really concerned about. At this point, we haven't had the severity, but we have frequency. It's, it's the same way as your, your, your workers' compensation, right? The more frequency claims, the more that that makes an impact on your mod factor. It's the same way when you're underwriting your workers' compensation, the more frequency issues that occur, the higher rate you're going to get, therefore increasing premium. So um, it is absolutely one of the, the areas for us that we can't control. Well, I would say, I mean, we're very interested, obviously, in uh, mitigating, you know, these issues with transportation. Um, these are the kinds of discussions proactively we'd like to have and to get guidance mm -hmm. on. So I'm glad that last Friday, you know, uh, we finally had a conversation about it in terms of what are some things that we can do, uh, resources that we can access uh, to try to do that. I think um, those discussions are probably more appropriate with the administrators overseeing that myself, the transportation business office, than um, necessarily the board table, although. Um, it's a, it is interesting information, but. What we're charged with this evening is approving the renewal. So I need to hear from you why our premium from last year went from 700000 to next year 862000 So if we go back to the pricing paid on, right? There's no way we can see that. All right. Here. I thought you guys would be looking behind you. Um, yeah. So what I'm we're trying to pay attention yeah. to you and no, so. you're great, you're great. So the property casualty last year was 176,000, and this year it's 302. Uh, that specifically has to do with nothing but the excess property rates. Anything that sits over your deductible on property insurance had about a 300% increase this year um, in the global marketplace. That is the structure that we Travis, put together. Can you enlarge just the chart so we can see that? Can you slide over just a little bit more and then I'll just talk about what the first two lines are. The point of the Oh, sorry. sorry. It's down. <laughs> All right, thanks. There we go. Okay. All right. That's yeah, great. Thank you. So what you're going to see is that really where you're seeing the increase is the property casualty fixed costs. It's the insurance carriers that say, I feel comfortable coming in and providing you a piece of paper that says that if your school gets damaged by a tornado or hail, that I'm going to go ahead and write that check. Uh, we just don't have the confidence in the marketplace of carriers saying that this is a state that they're willing and wanting to write business in. For 24 consecutive quarters, I believe it was 22 consecutive quarters, we had rate decreases in the property market, and then in the last two years, as you saw, we had $144 billion in losses and $80 billion in losses. In the last, I believe, 18 months, we had over 40 instances of 
one billion dollar or more catastrophic losses around them. So it's been it's an insurance marketplace um, determination and driver. It's not something that we can control. The way that we could save those premium dollars would be to cut coverage and to you know if we were to sublimit our flood from forty million to one hundred fifty thousand, we would have the ability to save significant dollars in premium. But our membership again, owned and operated by Iowa schools, is not willing to go back out on coverage. Other questions? The numbers that are presented to us, maybe for you, um, does that include the money that's returned? Because normally there's some money that's returned right, sure. each and year. So does the 536,000, say 17, 18, 19, that or is that just the total? Yeah, so that, that includes your variable cost too. And so what we'll do is as we get years away from those years, our surplus return policy has um, specifics on when that money can be returned. So for property casualty, it's three to five years. For work comp, it's five to seven years. So as soon as we get out to those years and make sure that all claims are closed in those policy years, we can start returning funds out of those years. So, so the number that's like, say, fiscal year 16 might have included a return on that management fund? Or do it with a different carrier in 16? Yeah. Because they all do the same thing? Well, to the, to the first slide, right, the, the difference between a dividend and a surplus, right, the dividend is an upfront over, overcharge to hopefully give money back if there is positive performance, whereas surplus building up equity to, again, put ownership in policy here, right? So there's a term incurred but not reported. So the reason that we, um, in the board, is determined to have the distribution policy, which we do for the surplus, is to make sure that we close out those policy years. So if any sexual abuse claim, you know, God forbid, would come up in future years on the road, we have that money in the contingency fund to therefore pay that claim and that liability. And the way I explain it to my neighbors is that if I rent an apartment, Right? Typically, the landlord will ask for a thousand dollar deposit, and then at the end of the year, if they come in, the blinds aren't broken, and I didn't, you know, punch any holes in the wall in college, that they would give me that deposit back. Um, that's a dividend program. Overpay, get it back at the end of the year. Should nothing happen, our program is we're betting on ourselves. We're buying a house, and we're building up equity, and then whatever we make on that house, if the value goes up or more, we're making an interest based on that investment. We then return that equity.
to actually pass the January 1st timeline, um, the renewal is set in a, as a part of the bylaws of the group that you participate in. You're in your third year right now. So you, if you would like to give notice and go out and seek other options, the way that that works is you give up notice to exit the program. We then exit you. You then can go out and get other options. Um, but to get back into this program, you would have to reapply, meaning we would re-rate you as a new ad. And unfortunately, based on your losses, I'm just going to give it to you straight. There may be something out there in the marketplace. There's competition in Iowa now, which is a good thing. They may go ahead and write that for political reasons or otherwise to get you back at a lower rate. That is highly possible. But one of the things about reapplying into this program is you're currently in it. You're not being canceled. You're paying a little bit more. but I can tell you right now that you are also a loss leader within our program on both frequency and severity, specifically with the tornado as well. Um, you're considered somebody that pulled the program down as opposed to propping it up, and I think that it would be a tough pill to swallow for our board to re you back in the program, which essentially leaves you maybe sitting on an island without a lot of things. So it's not one of those deals where you can go back and kind of redo deductibles and things like that and try to figure out No, because that's presented in front of the full membership and taken action on it. Anyway. And everyone in the program has the exact same coverage. So our largest number being Iowa City, we purchased our smallest number being yeah. I want to yeah. say uh, Laverne. Laverne, yeah, with 78 students, they have the exact same coverages as each other. So the only kind of optional coverage that you can get is the cyber, which ranges from two to five million, and you purchase five. So, so what's our window? I heard January. Yeah, you can give notice to withdraw in January. Right. So uh, we don't have to decide this tonight, then that's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. No, we do. This is no, this is the renewal from 7 1 to 7 1. Okay. We need a six month okay. notification okay. to withdraw. And 1920 is year three. Correct. Right? You're in year We're three. We're not nope. in year three right now. Right. Next year. We'll go. Next year is year this three. This renewal will be year three. Right. Correct. You join 7 1 and 17. Correct. But in the midst of year three, you can go through and do that. I change. And if you do leave one other thing is that the surplus or the variable cost that you have banked up in the years that you've been performing would stay with the program if you left. Yeah. So okay. I have a motion to approve the 2019-2020 property casualty and workers compensation renewal in the amount of eight hundred and sixty-two thousand five hundred and ninety-seven dollars. So moved. Second. Carter. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Aye. The motion carries 5 1. Would you like this um, in your suggestion and then in your no vote? Would you like this um, placed with the finance committee? Either that or just a, a little bit of explanation. I said, I'm like, not as informed as I need to be on it. That, that very well could be in front of me that I just don't remember the conversations from before. But uh, yeah, I, I know I don't totally understand. Conversations with, it, with Brian. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's been a while, and he's got a while. Yeah, um, and we've had a couple of instances tonight where we've not been as informed as we should have been. I'm telling you on behalf of the board, we need to be informed before we make these kinds of decisions because we have expended a tremendous amount of money this evening. And some of it was totally unprepared. So it, it needs to be more transparent for the board. It needs to, um, and I'm not sure that um, news and notes always does that. Um, it's hard to put all of the explanation in writing. 
So we have curriculum that comes to us a meeting ahead of time, and then we have time to ask questions, time to think, and then we approve at the next meeting. These major purchases like this need to do the same thing. We didn't know, not blaming anyone in particular, but we didn't know anything about the copier bid until this meeting. It's exactly why I voted no. Was presented. Not transparent enough. Um, this particular instance is the same. It's not transparent enough. Um, maybe we can talk about this in an agenda meeting or something. I think the thing that was that's awkward about this particular item is we're under a three-year agreement. We're kind of at the whim of. And, and there's only two insurance companies that we use an IRA, right? there's EMC, because we were on with EMC before, and I remember a little bit about this from changing from EMC to... Which so. was Shomo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that very well. So, you know, it, it was, you know, it, had, it took him explaining all that for me to kind of get back there at the end of it, and we had talked about it a little bit in finance, too, so we really need to be assured. Basically, after what we saw last year, so that was why I voted yes. But it is hard to stomach those big increases, and we probably need to figure out how we're going to do better next year. And so that we well, I think that everybody at this table needs to have, and that's part of the problem with committee work, committees doing the work. Then there are other people at the table who are not involved in that discussion and are not keyed in. So. I think we just need to bring that double the presentation. Yeah. Well, I'm, okay, I'm okay with the committees doing the work as long as I just meet output from the committee meeting on that kind of note. It was in the committee. That was, I guess, what, what I was asking for. Yeah. Okay, we're over to budget amendment. line area that we are requesting a budget amendment to increase the expenditures for the current fiscal year 2018-19 that's in the total support services area we're going uh, requesting um, an increase to 21.2 million from 18.398 um, this is basically if you remember last meeting we talked that this is not an increase in the overall budget of expenditures, but rather um, some coding changes that we're doing between functional line areas. So it's really a decrease in instruction and an increase in support services. Questions for Paula? I have a motion to approve the 2018-19 budget amendment as presented. So moved. Carter Hernandez, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same. The motion carries 6 0. And now we're to our favorite part of the meeting. Good news is we don't have a lot of elements. motion to delete 708.5 inventory and waive the second reading. Second. Fletcher Hernandez, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries 6-0. Uh, we have the same recommendation on 
seven ten point five financial support food service um, that is being recommended to be deleted as it's not an IASB policy and it isn't a accurate reflection of current practice. So we bring that back to the meeting. Well, we're going to delete. We can go on. gone back and forth on whether to bring that back for a second reading sure. since it's a major change. Or okay. So yeah, we'll lately we've been bringing them back. Okay. 7.11.1. Um, this is, we're recommending uh, markets reviewed. Seven eleven point one R one. Now we've got a minor change at the end of this particular regulation because that is not current practice. We've got a strikeout relative to a fee per ride. Okay, so we're bringing that one. Yep. Look at there. We're through policy. <laughs> Aren't you just amazed? <laughs> Anything to note? Uh, reminders, our next regular board meeting is June 3rd. We have a board work session on the 10th and 11th from 5 to 7 p.m. for our building data reports. And they will be here. We don't know which rooms we'll be using. And we're probably going to split up into three rooms and rotate, so it'll probably be the conference room, my office, and Matt's office, because there's projectors in there. Okay. Looks like I've got policies coming up. There's a SIAC meeting tomorrow night, too. Pardon me? There's a SIAC meeting tomorrow night. Okay. Um, and then there's a TQ meeting the following week. What have we done this evening to improve the education of students in the district? Did anybody tell you how much we spent? No. It would be mind-boggling, I think. I think the uh, passion that Katie and Austin had for IJAG was, was pretty awesome, mm -hmm. yeah. and the result. I think that's why there are so many kids that are choosing to do that. Great to see the History Day presentation. Mm -hmm. That's exciting to have a uh, new curriculum at Woodbury, or there will be soon after soon. 17 years. 17 years. That's <laughs> <laughs> It's probably the original curriculum then. Huh? <laughs> well, that would definitely be while Tom Renzi was there. How many more of those are out there that have been around for 17 years? Probably more than you care to admit. That would have been the original curriculum. 17 years. Yeah, my 23-year-old was the first class that would have gone to me. My quote for this evening comes from a company as opposed to an individual. It comes from Miname, which is a Seattle graphics design company. So somebody at the company said it. Always find time for the things that make you feel happy to be alive. Summer's coming up, take advantage. Because everybody has a dream on vacation now, right? <laughs> I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Who is over here? Fletcher. Fletcher Carter. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed the same. We are adjourned.